Bavaria is the largest state in Germany with an area of 70,500 square kilometers. It has international borders with Switzerland and Austria in the south and Austria and the Czech Republic on the east. Its plateau surrounded by hills is a real tourist paradise. Bertis Garden was built in the valley of the river Ache on the slopes of Lochstein and was an independent principality for almost 600 years. Its former Augustine monastery was used by the royal family as a castle from 1813. Its dormitorium houses an exhibition based on the art collection of Ruprecht, heir apparent to the throne. Many people visit the old salt mine, the Salzbergwerk, the exploitation rights of which were granted to the order by Frederick Barbarossa. However, most people would like to see Hitler's eagle's nest, but that was blown up in 1952, along with the neighboring castles of Göring and Bormann. The dictator liked to rule from this Olympic height, from where he could see not only Germany, but also his homeland, Austria an archive and a research center for the crimes of fascism have been established on its ruins. Garmisch was a small alpine dwelling inhabited by shepherds, but the neighboring Partenkirchen already existed in Roman times and was called Partenu. The residents of the two villages probably didn't like each other much. They even built their churches with their backs to each other, lest they should meet by chance. All this changed in 1935, when the two villages were united in order to have better chances at the tender to organize the Winter Olympics. This is when they built their ice skating stadium that was once the biggest in Europe, the three-run ski jump stadium at the foot of the Gutiberg and the bobsled track surrounded by mountain lakes. The city is still developing, and it's become one of the most well-known vacation and ski resorts of Germany. However, it's not only a paradise for winter sports. One of Europe's biggest swimming complexes and the first wellness center, Alpspitz, was built in the 1970s. It has a water surface of 2,000 square meters, a wave pool, and an open beach. In summer, people can also swim in Riesersee, Badersee, and Eibsee. Garmisch Partenkirchen is a real holiday resort with a well kept holiday park, theater, confectionaries, and restaurants. Richard Strauss bought a villa here from the royalties he received for his opera Salome and lived here until his death. We can find villas similar to Strauss's in both parts of the city, mixing with farmhouses built in Alpine style. There are some Franconian and Swabian, wooden beam-structured houses called Fachberg houses, but there are more Bavarian ones. The latter are shorter, stubbier. Earlier, these frescoes, also called Luftmalerei, used to portray religious scenes, but today they rather tell the story of the house itself or the family who owns the house. On the walls of hotels and shops, they're a form of advertisement. The wall of Garmisch's oldest inn, the Hussar, is decorated with the picture of a dragon looking out the window. well-kept gardens are full of flowers of an incredibly wide variety and naturally geraniums adorn all windowsills and railings. The new joint city hall was built in 1935 before the Winter Olympics. The most remarkable event in the city's surroundings is the Passion Play in Oberammergau. The inhabitants of the small mountain village have been performing the story of the Passion of Christ every 10 years for 380 years now. Their ancestors took a vow to do this at the time of the Great Plague. 
The Passion is performed for six months from morning until evening and is now a widely known event that draws hundreds of thousands of spectators. A real technical relic, one of the old locomotives of the Zugspitzbahn is exhibited in front of the Rathaus. New motor engines have taken its place in transportation, which may not be prettier, but are certainly more modern. Every winter, skiers, snowboarders, and extreme sports lovers invade the mountains around Garmisch. The lower station of the Zugspitzbahn is near the stadium. There's several ways to go up the mountain, including the cog rails, cable cars, funiculars, and ski lifts. But we can only get near the 2,966 meter high summit with the Zugspitzbahn. Experienced hikers and mountain climbers can also reach the summit on foot in nine hours. The first person to reach the Zugspitze in this way was a Bavarian soldier in 1920. The tracks wind between the houses on the western part of Garmisch, then make their way up the steep hillside. Through the pine forests, we can see spectacular mountain lakes sparkling. The last stretch of the journey takes us through a long tunnel. Emerging from the tunnel, we're greeted by a beautiful small lake, and after a couple of minutes, we reach the top station. On the summit, we'll find a ski lift and a rest house with two coats of arms on its railings to show where Bavaria ends and where the Austrian province, Tyrol, begins. From the huge terrace, we can see the surrounding mountains of Vank, Esterberg, Eckbauer, Grasek, and Kreuzek. There's a small chapel on the snow-speckled summit where victims of the mountains are commemorated. The restaurant of the rest house offers tourists, mountaineers, and skiers real Bavarian specialties and hot drinks. For our way down, we can also choose the cable car, the Seilbahn, that takes us to the small lake of Ibsay instead of Garmisch. Ibze is a crystal clear, emerald colored mountain lake. Campgrounds and hotels have been built here, and many people come here in summer to swim and row boats. Bavaria has plenty of standing and flowing water. Especially the areas south of the Danube are full of lakes, large and small. These are probably the remains of the Ice Age. Mark Twain wrote the following in his travelogue, A Tramp Abroad. 
We seemed to look down into fairyland. Two or three thousand feet below us was a bright green level with a pretty town in its midst and a silvery stream winding among the meadows. The charming spot was walled in on all sides by gigantic precipices clothed with pines. And over the pines, out of the softened distances, rose the snowy domes and peaks of the Monte Rosa region. How exquisitely green and beautiful that little valley down there was. The distance was not great enough to obliterate details. It only made them little and mellow and dainty. Like landscapes and towns seen through the wrong end of a spyglass. Kimsei is also called the Bavarian Sea, since it's the largest standing water of the province. This lake was also created in the Ice Age and has an area of approximately 18 kilometers by 14 kilometers. The area was already inhabited in Roman times, and according to legend, Pontius Pilate died in exile on its banks. Three 1,700-meter-high mountaintops reflect on the surface of the lake. Several rare species of birds nest on the marshlands of the Tiroler Ache Delta. The nearby village of Kieming is considered the capital of the area. This offers the best view of the islands, and we can reach them with the pleasure boat that sails from here. The Heron Insel, or the Gentleman Island, is the largest island of the Kiemsee. It's situated on the southwestern shore of the lake and has an area of 2.5 square kilometers. If you don't feel like walking the 2.5 kilometers to the Neue Schloss, there are horse-drawn carriages to take you there. Traces of construction work from times before Christ have been found on the southern part of the island. The monastery of the Order of St. Benedict is also a ruin. The building itself was destroyed by the marauding Hungarians. The Order of St. Augustine built a new monastery and church in 1130, which they used until the order was dissolved in 1803. Ever since Ludwig II built the Neue Schloss, or New Castle, on the island, the monastery has been called the Old Castle. Ludwig II became famous for his expensive castle buildings, an enthusiasm for German legends and the works of Wagner. His lavish spending emptied the otherwise inexhaustible national treasury. His castle on the Heroninsel was meant to imitate Versailles, the castle of his role model, the Sun King. The castle was never really completed, and after the king drowned, some half-completed parts of it were demolished. But despite this, the building complex is grandiose and spectacular. Its 103-meter-long facade is especially beautiful, as is the castle park in front of it, where the old fountain has been restored to its original splendor. The most beautiful room of the castle, and Ludwig II's favorite place, was the mirror room. Every night, the light of 2,300 candles was reflected in the mirrors. In the reclining room, Silver birds sitting on golden tree branches were supposed to create the illusion of nature that was never really far away, just outside the window. Sailing away from the gentleman island, we pass the deserted Krautinsel. The small inhabited island of the lake is the Fraueninsel. A female order of the Order of St. Benedict settled on this island in 770. Their cloister also became a victim of the marauding Hungarians. A Roman-style church was built on its foundations in the 11th century and was rebuilt in Gothic style 400 years later. During a renovation, the remains of a Carolingian-era palace were discovered under the gate of the main entrance. The convent is still inhabited by nuns who run a secondary school and a boarding school.
The three floors of the octagonal belfry represent three different eras, the 11th, 14th, and 17th centuries. Its 1,000-year-old bronze knocker is shaped like the head of a lion. From the island, we sail back to the mainland and continue our journey from Kimze on the small train. With the green nostalgic cars of the Kimze Bahn, we can reach the neighboring holiday spot of Grabenstadt. From there, the warm water of the Tutensee is a good alternative for those who find the water of Kimse too cold to bathe in. The dream castle of Neuschwanstein was Ludwig II's main piece of work. When the king was dragged away from the castle, its construction was still ongoing, but the costs were already over six million imperial marks. The castle of Hohenschwangau towers over a romantic little shooting lodge. The ancient nest of the Wittelsbachs lies in a picturesque setting at the foot of 1,700-meter-high pine-covered hills in the valleys of rapid streams next to alpine lakes. The members of the family include Maximilian II, Ludwig of Bavaria, the Greek King Otto, and Queen Elizabeth, who was also known as Sissi. The royal family rebuilt the ruins of the medieval castle of the Schwangau Knights in neo-Gothic style. But Ludwig wasn't satisfied with this castle. He wanted to create the fairy tale castle of the Graal Knights. He wanted to unite everything that had captured him in Wartburg Castle and the castles of the Knights along the Rhone. Interestingly, he didn't hire an architect to do the planning, but a theatrical set designer from Munich, Christian Jank, who had designed several of the sets used in Wagner's operas. The ingenious designs were implemented by three royal architects, Riedel, Dolmann, and Hoffmann. From the foot of Hohenschwangau, we can travel up to the Marienbrücke, or Marienbridge, with a horse-drawn cart or a bus. Legend has it that Ludwig often used to stop on the bridge spanning the Perlat Gorge, and looking down, he dreamt up the castle that is still the most beautiful when seen from there. After sightseeing and taking pictures, visitors can make their way up on foot to the main entrance that is almost one kilometer high. Neuschwanstein was associated with romance and fairy tales on such a large scale that the Disney studio modeled the Castle of Sleeping Beauty after it. It was built in Disneyland, and the logo of the company is also this. Ludwig became king at the age of 18, following his father's death. He sent for Wagner almost immediately. He loved his operas because he saw his own dream world come alive in them. He was especially caught by the story of the Swan Knight, Lohengrin, as he felt this character the closest to himself. He traveled to the places of German legends on foot and horseback, collecting ideas for his dream castle. The cornerstone of Neuschwanstein was laid down in September 1869. Each tower, bastion, gate, balcony, hallway, small or large room represents a legend or Wagner's adaptation of it. Dozens of fresco painters, mosaic artists, wood carvers, sculptors, interior designers, and craftsmen worked on the lavish inner spaces. The chandeliers, inlays, windows, gold plating, tapestries, and frescoes are reminiscent of the romance of old times, but the technical facilities were of the highest standards of the era. 
The emperor didn't neglect to install modern kitchen appliances, bathrooms, central heating, and elevators. The castle wasn't even built when the ministers conspired against the overspending king and had him declared insane. He was taken from his dream castle and locked up in the small castle of Berg. His body was found two days later in Lake Starnberg, along with that of Dr. Guden, the psychiatrist who certified him. Did the doctor want to stop the king from committing suicide? Or did the king kill the doctor first, and then himself? Or was it all just an accident? Or perhaps the ministers weren't satisfied with simply removing Ludwig. They wanted a more permanent solution. We'll never know. Ludwig's cousin Sissy said that the king wasn't insane, he was just an eccentric man living in a dream world. Lucino Visconti made a large-scale film from the life of Ludwig II in 1973. Many consider Königsee, with its dark green-colored water, the most beautiful alpine lake. The eight-kilometer-long, yet only two-kilometer-wide lake is really deep. That's why its crystal-clear water glistens in dark colors. On two sides, the lake is surrounded by tall, steep cliffs that cast shadows on its surface, causing the sun to seemingly set at 4 p.m. The village of Königsee is famous for its wooden boathouses. Here we can take a speedboat and see the sights of the lake, the cliff that reflects an echo seven times and the King's Creek that flings itself down in desperate suicide from a height of 800 meters. Sailing past a small island, we come to the lakeside village of St. Bartholomew. Its only significant site is its pilgrimage church, whose unusual layout shapes a clover leaf, and its towers are covered by an onion dome. The capital of Bavaria, Munich, lies north of the Austrian border, some 100 kilometers from Salzburg. Karlsplatz lies in the heart of the city with its fountain surrounded by symmetric buildings in a semicircle. This is where the most famous promenade leading to the main square starts and is first called the Neuhauser, then the Kaufingerstrasse. Karlstor, standing on the main square, has been the western gate of the city since 1315. When the weather is nice, the terraces of the promenade fill up with people and vendors offer their goods from their stands. As we come closer to Marienplatz, the main square, the number of old houses increases. The cool spray of water from the Salome fountain feels very good in the heat. The monument was erected by Hans Wimmer in 1962 to commemorate Richard Strauss, the famous son of Munich. Behind the fountain, the main church of the Jesuits, the Michaelskirche, stands by modestly. Its crypt is the final resting place for 30 members of the Wittelsbach family. A small stone statue stands at the corner of the Hirmer clothes store with a small tower in its hands. The tower represents the beautiful tower that was the western border of the city of Henry the Lion. The Frauenkirche, or the Cathedral of Our Blessed Lady, with its two towers, is perhaps the best known building in Munich. The two towers, with their unique domes, can be seen from virtually anywhere. The cathedral was originally built in the Roman era and was reconstructed in Gothic style by the greatest medieval architect, Jörg Ganghofer. In those days, almost all large constructions lasted for several decades. In this case, this was explained by a nice story. There's a huge black footprint behind the main entrance. According to legend, this footprint belonged to the devil himself. 
who wasn't allowed to take the master until the building was completed. Looking at it from this point of view, the building will never be finished. The missing windows are hidden by columns. The new city hall on the main square was built by Georg Haberisser at the turn of the 18th and 19th centuries. The huge neo-Gothic palace has six inner courtyards and the richly decorated statues on the facade portray Bavarian kings, prince electors, and allegorical and mythical figures. The main spectacle of the 85-meter high tower is Europe's fourth largest glockenspiel, in which 45 bells play four melodies. Keeping in line with German traditions, the basement of the city hall has been turned into a beer parlor, and since the building is so big, there are even two of them in it. The most famous beer parlor of the city is the Hofbräuhaus, where good Bavarian beer has been brewed and served since 1589. At first it belonged to the king, but since 1853, it's been in possession of the state. 6,000 beer lovers can enjoy a good beer in the Hofbräuhaus at the same time. The atmosphere of the beer parlors is complete with the typical Bavarian music played mainly on brass wind instruments. In summer, people can sit outside in the huge garden area underneath the shady chestnut trees and a fountain decorated with lions. Prince Regentenstrasse and the bridge with the same name lead to the statue of the Angel of Peace. The city of Munich commemorates the 25 years of peace after the peace treaty was signed in 1871 with this piece of art made by Hellmeyer, Duhl, and Petzold. The Theresia Field, behind the Bavaria Ring, may seem familiar to many people, and no wonder, as this is where the Oktoberfest is held every autumn. An incredible amount of people flock to Munich for the beer festival to taste all the frothy specialties. Who else could look down onto this typical Bavarian festival if not the statue of the lady personifying the country, Bavaria? The 1972 Summer Olympics were also held in Munich. The big stadium is a spectacular building with large sweeping canopies of acrylic glass stabilized by steel cables covering the spectators area. The 290 meter Olympic Tower looms over the park. Its observation deck can be reached by elevators. Augsburg is the third largest city of Bavaria. In the Middle Ages, the imperial free city was ruled by its own prestigious citizens, among others the Fugger and Walser families. The artisans of Augsburg produced the most famous watches and silversmiths' works, but its knife and textile production and book printing were also significant. The guilds traded their goods with foreign countries as well. The Gotthaus was designed by Elias Hole in the beginning of the 1600s and is Central Europe's largest town hall. Its nine-story high facade is basically Renaissance style, but the two towers project the early Baroque. The architect used the walls that were already standing here from earlier and built over the 18th century St. Peter's Church almost completely. Going closer to the building, we can see that the 70-meter-high Perlach Tower is not part of the same style town hall, but stands next to it independently. The golden statue of the goddess Sisa stands on its top. The first Celtic, then Roman settlement, commemorates the Emperor Augustus in its name. The statue of the Emperor stands on top of a fountain in the mosaic-tiled square opposite the town hall. The statues were created by the Dutch sculptor Hubert Gerhard, whose most beautiful works of art are the treasures of Munich today. The history of Ingolstadt doesn't go back as far as that of Augsburg or Nuremberg. The first written reference to the settlement was on a certificate from 806. It became a city in 1250, and this is when its first ducal palace was built. Later, the city became the capital of the Duchy Bavaria Ingolstadt. This is where Prince Ludwig the Rich founded the first German university that was fortified and surrounded by a castle wall in 1537, based on Dürer's plans. 
The southern gate of the Franconian Alpine Plains was already famous for its handicraft industry in the Middle Ages. It became an industrial town in the 20th century, and today it's best known for the Audi cars being manufactured here. There's nothing in the antique city center with its pleasant atmosphere that would imply that it's a 21st century industrial city. With an eye on environmental protection, factories are built far from the inner city. The Cathedral of Our Lady, or the Liebfraunmünster in German, is the largest hall church of Bavaria. The church was under construction for over a hundred years and was only consecrated in 1525. The sturdy tower of the red brick building is a surprising contrast to its high nave. Its button-like steeple is more characteristic for a lot smaller churches. Because so much time passed between its design and completion, several styles are represented in the building. The beautiful net vault over the side chapels and the Gothic glass mosaic portraying the Annunciation are remarkable. The main altar was made by local craftsmen in 1527. As the city became richer and larger, new city walls, situated in more or less concentric circles, also started growing around it. A part of the city wall and the gates that open from it can still be seen, and they represent the architectural styles and the various tastes of the different eras. Shops, beer parlors, and cafe houses beckon visitors on the ground floor of the Gothic and Baroque rows of houses on the elegant promenade, the Ludwigstrasse. The reason that the palace of the Bavarian princes built here in 1418 is called the Neue Schloss, or the New Castle, is that a castle already stood here before. A wing of the old castle can still be seen. The whitewashed Gothic block of the New Castle has almost no decorations and is spectacular, primarily due to its immensity. The highest tower of the stronghold that stands in the corner of the one-time city wall looks over the Danube and a fortified passage runs along its foot. The building currently houses an exhibition of the Bavarian Military Museum. The area of Regensburg was already inhabited in the Stone Age. The Celtics lived here in ancient times and gave the city its first name, Radasbona. In the first century AD, the Romans built a fort here and called it Castra Regina. Later, the Agilofing ruling family established a city in its place, which became more and more significant with the passing centuries. In the Middle Ages, coronations and imperial conventions were held here. The first national assembly was called by Charlemagne in 792, then from 1663, Regensburg became the permanent seat of the Reichstag, the participants of which were secular and ecclesiastical princes and the representatives of the free cities and orders. The first ruler from the Hohenstaufen House was elected here, and this is where Otto of Wittelsbach was crowned the Prince of Bavaria. Walking through the narrow streets and ancient squares, on the small square next to the city hall, we come across the memorial of Don Juan of Austria, the victor of the 1571 Battle of Lepanto. This hero of the century was born from a misalliance. His mother was the daughter of a craftsman. His father, the melancholic Charles V, is commemorated on the wall of the Golden Cross Inn on Heidelplatz. The Golden Cross Inn was a top-notch restaurant in its prime and this is where the great master chef, Marie Chandry, used to cook in the last century. She wrote a book for the gourmet kitchen of posterity called the Regensburg Cookbook. The ancient city of Regensburg is the fourth largest city of Bavaria today. The 60-hectare old town is part of the world heritage and is home to 1,400 heritage buildings. Goethe also loved Regensburg. 
His contemporary and colleague, Werner Bergengrün, wrote, For a few days, I give myself to this inexhaustible city, but I'd rather have liked to give myself over to it for a year, a decade, or a lifetime. The Goldene Bärenstraße received its name after the one-time Golden Bear Inn. The famous astronomer, Johannes Kepler, died in house number five. A plaque has been placed on the house with a Gothic gable, but Renaissance windows, and an exhibition can be seen in its rooms. In the Middle Ages, the houses of the forever competing rich families were practically fortresses. Not many have remained of them in the Low Countries, and in Italy, they can almost only be seen in Tuscany. The Goliath House, whose facade is decorated by a Renaissance fresco, is one of the 20 patrician houses still standing in Regensburg. Its towers also had a defense function. The building of St. Peter's Cathedral began in 1275 on the foundations of a basilica from Roman times. The walls of this basilica were only discovered nowadays in the square in front of the southern facade. The building of the cathedral took a long time. It was hindered by some typical events of the Middle Ages, like the plague, and some events that are not uncommon even today, like war or lack of funds. One of the master builders was even beheaded for treason. The cathedral was finally completed in 1534, but the steeples were only put in place in the 19th century. The layout of the cathedral is unusual. Contrary to other Gothic cathedrals, the presbytery isn't surrounded by chapels, and the transept doesn't reach beyond the walls. The Gothic pulpit of the main nave was built in 1482, and the 17-meter-high carved tabernacle isn't much younger either. The silver main altar was a gift to the church from a duke of the Fugger family. In the northern aisle, a marble shrine created according to the plans of Canova can be found. Napoleon's henchman, the Duke Karl von Dahlberg, lies in it. Napoleon himself visited Regensburg in 1803 and stayed in the house on Cathedral Square. A plaque commemorates this occasion. This is how the politics of the era became a part of history. When the emperor abolished Regensburg's imperial free city status, it didn't make him very popular. Six years later, when he defeated the Austrian troops at Regensburg, his popularity increased greatly. The Valhalla Towers near Regensburg, next to the village of Donaustauf. The idea of the snow-white portico and the building resembling a Greek church came from Ludwig I of Bavaria, who asked his royal architect, Leo von Klenze, to create a copy of the Parthenon in Athens. 358 steps lead up to the Temple of Glory from the valley. The portico is 125 meters long and 50 meters wide. The pediments of its facade are supported by eight huge pillars. Thus, they reflect the proportion of the original building. The large framework that supports the roof and is already missing from the original Parthenon was also built onto the hall. Because of this, contrary to the one in Greece, semi-darkness looms in the building. Its boarded ceiling is decorated with golden ornaments and statues of prominent people deemed worthy by the king to be exhibited in the hall. A spectacular view of the winding Danube can be seen from the steps of Valhalla. The most spectacular castle of the area 
The first Mbao looms over the village of Wurt on the Donau that only has a population of 3,000 people. The castle was built by the Bishop of Regensburg in the 12th century. The old tower of the original building became the heart of the castle built later. The other seven towers that rise from the castle walls were built in the 17th and 18th century, just like the quarters of the then bishop who had a taste for splendor. Today, these quarters are the main building of the castle. In the horseshoe-shaped inner courtyard of the building, complex outdoor games are held every summer and festivals of sacred music are organized from time to time. The magnificence of the Elector's Palace is in sharp contrast to the impressively simple Castle Chapel. Of course, the latter wasn't made for the bishop, but for the people, and soldiers, craftsmen, and servants came here to pray. Nuremberg, with its half a million inhabitants, is the second largest city of Bavaria and the capital of Franconia. Nuremberg was already called the jewel box of the German Empire in the Middle Ages, and the masses of tourists visiting the city clearly shows that this is still true today. The largest church of the city is the Lorenzkirche, whose twin towers reach up into the sky in the middle of the old town. The main facade of the majestic Gothic building was sculpted, according to the year written on it, in 1332. Based on church documents, the presbytery was handed over in 1477. The sturdy Gothic tower standing on the corner of Königstrasse, next to the Lorenzkirche, is the oldest bourgeois house of the city. It was built in the 14th century by a tradesman from Nassau. We can imagine the wealth that these tradesmen had if they could afford to build houses like these. The ancient city lost its significance in trade after the discovery of America because, contrary to the Hansa cities, it had no access to the sea. The big dream many people had of the Rhine-Main-Donau Channel was only realized in 1972 almost making Nuremberg a sea harbor. Walking south on the promenade, we soon come to the modern fountain whose figures portray the relationship between men and women. The figures resembling mythological fawns portray the first sweet moment, the period of getting to know each other, of courting, the happiness at the beginning of marriage, then speak sourly of the storms that come the habits, the boredom, and the regret. It's a caricature-like work of art, but makes people think. The old houses that remind us of the age of romance prevail until the city walls, but beyond that, the architecture of modern times is characteristic. Those interested can check out the old corn market and the toll house on Königstrasse. The basement of the toll house is today a beer parlor, its neighbor, the arcaded building of the former civil armory, was also built in the 16th century. The craftsman's yard was established, kind of like an open-air museum, next to the Königstor, the southern gate on the wall of the old town. Even today, craftsmen work and sell their goods here on the weekend. On these occasions, potters, silversmiths, and gingerbread bakers work between the walls that have remained in excellent condition. Today, no one would be able to tell that the beautiful houses of Nuremberg were built on the silt islands and floodplains of the Pegnitz River. Ten bridges spanned the river in the city, 
and their wide motorways and also medieval pedestrian bridges. The Fleischbrück, or Meat Bridge, received its name after the cattle that were shepherded across it on their way to the slaughterhouse. The famous Hungarian grey cattle made their way across half of Europe, mostly on foot, to end their lives in the slaughterhouse of Nuremberg. The cobbled Museumbrücke, leading from Lorenzplatz to Markplatz, belongs to the pedestrians. Its stone railing is decorated with statues. The modern statues of figures huddled together in a ship commemorate the explorers of the seas. After the takeover by Hitler, the city became the site of the Nazi Party Congresses. However, Nuremberg is even more famous for the Nuremberg Trials, in which the International Military Tribunal prosecuted Nazi war criminals. In the Middle Ages, the city was famous for its master bards and gingerbread. Bards still perform in the supermodern hall, the Meistersingerhalle, and luckily, gingerbread can also still be bought. Especially at the famous local attraction, the Christkindlmarkt, or Christmas market, held before Christmas in the old marketplace of the city. The Frauenkirche, Church of Our Lady, standing humbly on the edge of the square, was designed by Peter Parler, main architect of Prague in the Charles era. Its main facade is decorated with tiny towers in stepped formation and uniquely above its crested balcony rail is a separate chapel. Its clockwork is also similar to the one in Prague. Every day at noon, it shows how the prince electors bowed in front of the emperor. The building was severely damaged in the Second World War and later restored, but several frescoes couldn't be saved. The beautiful fountain standing in the marketplace is the work of Heinrich de Balier. It's a 20-meter-high, graceful sandstone building decorated with figurines. We can see the seven prince electors already known from the clockwork, and next to them, a group of real or mythological figures chosen wantonly stand in the water, the fountain, for 600 years. The figures include Julius Caesar, Alexander the Great, David, Judas Maccabeus, Moses, King Clovis, and Knight Gottfried Bouillon. From the northwest corner of the main square, a steep road takes us up to the castle. This is where the old town hall stands that was severely damaged in the Second World War, similarly to the Church of Our Lady and several other buildings in Nuremberg. The new town hall was handed over in 1955 and it stands behind the old town hall. Opposite this is the St. Sebaldus Church. Sebaldus was a recluse who arrived to Nuremberg from Denmark and has been the patron saint of the city since 1072. A church with two towers was erected over his grave and was altered several times until it started looking like it does today. Nuremberg is divided by a river. The northern part of the city is called Sebaldusstadt after the saint, while the southern part, with the Lorenzkirche, is called Lorenzstadt. One of the most beautiful bourgeois houses on the Burgstrasse houses the Old Town Museum, and there's also an exhibition of several thousand of tin soldiers nearby. Albrecht Dürer, the Hungarian-born German printmaker, silversmith, and painter, was one of the most prominent figures of the Renaissance. He was born in Nuremberg in 1471, and aside from a few travels to mostly Italy, he spent all of his life there. The Tiergärtner Tor is a small, sloping square under the city wall with an irregular layout. It's surrounded by old, wooden-framed houses, and in the middle of the square is the large statue of the rabbit, that was the favorite and recurring motif for Dürer's prints. The square above the Dürer house is the favorite meeting place for the local youth and the starting point of walks through the old town. Dürer bought the house in 1509, which became his home, his workshop, and his store at the same time. He lived there with his wife, 
his mother, assistants, and servants. Besides his artwork, he created the first scientific star chart and published his theoretical works in a book. He died in the spring of 1528 and was laid to eternal rest in the St. John Cemetery in Nuremberg. His epitaph reads, Whatever was mortal in Albrecht Dürer lies beneath this mound. The rhombus-shaped Old Town is surrounded by a 5-kilometer long, 8-meter high, and sometimes 13-meter thick castle wall defended by a hundred bastions and towers. The walls running up the hill come together at the castle district. The Nuremberg Castle is in reality the remains of two castles, the Burg Grafenburg and the Kaiserburg. The first was built by the people of Nuremberg in the 12th century as protection from the Hohenzollern, then only Zollern family, that wanted to take control over the city. Nothing much remained of this castle as it was burned down by Louis VII, who also wanted to get his hands on Nuremberg. Kaiserburg is the largest fortified medieval castle of Franconia. It was built to provide accommodation for the Holy Roman Emperors who came to the city to participate in the imperial conventions called together according to the order of Charles IV. Since the emperors traveled with a large entourage, the castle had to be sufficiently big and luxurious. After many expansions and remodeling, the building we see today is the same that it was under the rule of Frederick I. A spectacular view can be seen from the top of the city walls. According to linguists, the name Bayreuth refers back to the forest that was cut down by the Bavarians to make room for the settlement. Whether this is true or not is unknown. The city itself was annexed to Bavaria only in 1810 and is the capital of Upper Franconia. Its population was always made up of more Franks than Bavarians. The city's opera house is one of the last Baroque opera houses in Europe that remained untouched. Frederick Margrave and his wife Wilhelmina had it built starting in 1745 by the distinguished Italian specialist Giuseppe Galli Bibiena. One of the neighbors of the opera house is the theater where lavish balls were held, and the other is the old synagogue. The latter survived the Second World War only because it is so tightly built together with the opera that has lots of wooden structural elements. In order to protect the opera, the Nazis spared the synagogue. The public considers Bayreuth to be Wagner's city. The composer had to flee because of his participation in the 1848 revolution and only returned to the German territory at the request of Ludwig II, an admirer of his art, in 1864. First settled down in Munich and only moved to Bayreuth seven years later, where he lived until his death. His classical style family villa, the Vonfried, lies on the northeast edge of the Hofgarten and was turned into a memorial museum in the 1970s. Specialists consider the most valuable part of the legacy to be the score of eight operas with their drafts, instructions for the orchestra, and letters. The composer died in 1883 while on a trip to Venice and was buried in the garden of the villa. The Neue Schloss or New Castle is also situated in the Hofgarten near Vonfried. Today, the Baroque Palace houses the local history collection including, of course, Wagner's statue, and in the other wing, the rich collection of the National Gallery can be seen. Bayreuth is located on the Main River between the Fichtel Mountains and the Frankish Alp and was annexed to Bavaria by Napoleon. Three special buildings of the Margrave family can be seen around the city. In the park of the Fantasy Castle, we can visit the artificial lake and the rock cave. In the Eremitage castle, we can look around in the gallery and in the dome of the Sun Temple. The Sun God drives his bronze chariot drawn by four horses. 
The main facade is covered with crystals and semi-precious stones. The historical old town of Bayreuth occupies only a small area. Besides the opera house, the theater, the parish church, and the buildings of the Hofgarten, the only things we can admire are the neat streets and the mostly classicist villas. But that's okay, since everyone comes here because of Wagner anyway. For decades, Richard Wagner had planned to build his own theater where he could direct his own plays, but the death of his patron made implementation significantly harder. In the end, the foundation stone of the Bayreuth Theater was laid down on his 59th birthday. The Festspielhaus, that has become the mecca of Wagner fans, stands on a 380-meter high hill. Gottfried Semper's original plans were simplified by Otto Bruchwald under Wagner's watching eye. The theater opened its gates in 1876 with the Ring of the Nibelung, but it took decades for the Bayreuth Festival, organized every summer, to become really popular. Of course, there aren't only large cities in Bavaria. The real atmosphere of the state lies in the many typical small towns and villages that are similar to each other in many aspects, yet are all unique. The wooden houses, the high red-tiled roofs with the mini skylights, the old signs, the city walls, antique churches, domes and steeples, narrow streets and river banks, the large green areas and the many flowers take us to a world that is almost fairy tale like calm and jovial. The layout of the settlements often follow that of medieval times, and in some places even the city walls have remained. Trade is bustling on the ground floors of the houses, and people sit on the same squares where their ancestors used to sit. Settlements are separated by dark pine forests, green hills, meadows, and cultivated lands. Although today Bavaria is only one of the German states, still, we can feel everywhere that it's different, friendlier, more cheerful than the other states of the country. <laughs> ¶¶ 